The ocean holds many secrets, and there is a place in the sea which hides the secrets of the whale, a place of mystery and intrigue, a place of danger and death, a sunken tomb, where only the bold may dare to enter, to try and unravel the secrets hidden for centuries. Come with us now as our intrepid explorers journey to the darkened depths, searching for answers to an ancient puzzle in an attempt to solve the mystery of the whale cave. The sea holds many mysteries. Within this blue realm, untold joys and tragedies echo across oceans of time. For the sea contains not only the precious commodity of life, but evidence of intelligence and feeling. Some believe that the emotion and conscience of the ocean world finds its most vibrant source in the heart and mind of the whale. This is their story, a story of silent tragedy, of lives lost in the deep, and the resolution of the mystery of four whale skeletons locked for ages in the dark caverns beneath the South Pacific. The South Pacific Ocean is dotted with thousands of islands and atolls. The warm waters of the Pacific provide a fertile ground for the most diverse marine life on the planet. Creatures great and small exist together in one single grand symphony of life. It is the presence of the reef that makes this harmony possible. The reefs provide shelter for the young and countless homes for a variety of animals whose colors mimic that of the rainbow. But it is not always peaceful within this liquid realm. The trials and tribulations of life go on each day in the struggle for survival. Each animal coexists within its own specific niche with other animals. It is a symbiotic dance that has existed for eons. Into this ocean paradise often come visitors including marine mammals such as dolphins and whales. For them, the reefs provide a way station, an oasis, if you will, where they may feed, frolic, and mate in the clear ocean depths. Reef systems, like those found in Fiji, are volcanic in origin. The islands and atolls here sprang up along the area known as the Rim of Fire, where the Pacific Tectonic Plate and the Australian Plate meet. Occasionally, the crust beneath the sea here will erupt with volcanic flows. Unchecked, these flows will eventually reach the surface of the sea and form islands. Once the flow has ceased and the lava has cooled, Organisms called corals move in and begin to call the cooled lava rock their home. Once the corals have taken hold, other organisms soon follow. Eventually, a new reef system is established, complete with an ecosystem replete with animals of every kind and color. Though the corals change the nature of the volcanic rock close to the surface, they do little to change the structure of the rock itself. In many cases, the volcanic flows which form the island and atoll leave openings called tubes. These tubes, where hot lava once flowed, form intricate underwater cave systems. Our mystery begins within one of these caves. Located off a remote island in Fiji, lies an atoll, the remnants of a once small island. Near the surface, this reef looks much like any other reef found in the South Pacific. But the uniqueness of this particular reef lies deep below the surface. In the 100 to 200 foot range, 
the wall of the reef takes on a much different character. It is lined with cave systems and sharp drop-offs, which extend its depth to over a thousand feet. One particular cave system begins with a huge opening, much like an amphitheater in the side of the rock. The entrance to this cave begins at 180 feet and is enormous. It appears out of the darkness like a huge hole in the rock. Once inside this entrance, the cave begins to narrow considerably, branching off at an upward angle. The floor looks much like carved steps. These are volcanic ledges, but give the appearance of having been created by an intelligent hand lending an eerie feeling to the darkness of the cave itself. Fifty feet beyond the entrance of the cave rests the first clue to our mystery. A large skeleton facing the blue water exit lies on its back. Over time, its bones have literally been fused to the rock by coral growth. Further up into the cave, Hidden in a secondary chamber lies another large skeleton. It is also facing outward to a sure exit. Venturing deeper through twisting and turning corners, the cave continues to rise rapidly as it narrows. Eventually, the cave squeezes to the size of a crawl space where the last clue in our mystery can be found. In this, the last cavern, a place so small that a diver must remove his tank in order to enter, lie two small skeletons. They are wedged into the cramped room, together for eternity, locked in a saltwater sarcophagus. Investigation has shown that all four of these skeletons are the remains of Globicephala macrorhynchus, commonly known as the short fin pilot whale. We know this much about them, but everything else is a mystery. Such as, how did they get here? How long have they been lying in this cave? Why are two of the skeletons facing the exit to the open water and air above? What would have driven these air-breathing animals to swim so deeply into a cave, a place of almost certain death? Have we stumbled upon some ancient burial ground where island whales go to die? Or is this the remains of a whale family, parents and children who died together? Perhaps some clues to this mystery can be found in the behavior of other whales. Most whales exist within groups, much like societies. Small groups within a society are known as pods. These pods are very complex in their organization, with individuals performing certain roles within the unit. The presence of such organization has been seen as a mark of high intelligence. The picture that emerges from studying whales, such as pilot whales, right whales, and orcas, is one of caring and concern for the young. All whales seem to share in the upbringing of calves within the group. The investment that whales make in the young is enormous. Baby whales are watched over by several members of the pod, besides the mother, and are protected from predators. Members of the pod help to educate the young, teaching them proper social behavior and how to catch prey. Young whales spend a great deal of their playtime learning how to communicate with other members of the pod and using their sonar capabilities. Once mastered in early adulthood, this inborn trait allows them to literally see in the dark. Could this youthful inexperience provide answers to some of the questions surrounding our mystery? 
The search for answers takes us many thousands of miles away to a remote archipelago off the coast of Africa. The island, known as Tenerife, is part of the Canary Islands, which were formed much the same way as Fiji. Here too, pilot whales come to feed and mate. The deep water channels between the Canary Islands provide pilot whales with fertile hunting grounds. Large herds of pilot whales feed on the abundant supply of squid and fish that live deep below the surface. The pilot whales around the island of Tenerife are so prevalent that people come from miles around to watch and study them in the temperate Atlantic waters. Because of the popularity of these whale watching trips, the Spanish government, which controls the Canary Islands, has passed extensive laws to protect the whales from human harassment. On the forefront of whale conservation, the government here, recognizing the need for environmental laws, has implemented a system that accommodates both the tourism industry and the protection of the pilot whale. Pilot whales are, in reality, not true whales at all, but rather a member of the dolphin family. They are, in fact, one of the largest dolphins. Only the orca is larger. Males can average 21 feet long and weigh up to three tons. These whales are some of the most social animals on Earth. They are found in most oceans and are almost never sighted alone. There is a bond among these animals that runs as deep as any human family. Cetacean scientist Dr. James Boran has been studying pilot whales and their social interaction for years. His work led to the first whale conservation laws passed in the Canary Islands. Yeah, we first started our research in 1989. There had been a few observations before then from boats, and that's kind of how we heard about it. But when Sarah Heimlich Boran and I came here, there really hadn't been any, any detailed studies about the pilot whales. We did find out, we talked to a few of the captains at the time, there were probably five or six boats that did a day trip and then they found out that, that in, in Spanish, the whale is called calderon, for as it's caldera, the cald, cauldron pothead. And they found that in English, they were called a whale. And this one guy told me, he says, as soon as we could start marketing it as whale watching, the, uh, the business started to increase, that people were more interested. In, uh, and this was probably, you know, 87, 88, something. 1991, there was probably up to about eight to 10 boats, say. And now, I don't know what the number is, it's, it's at least 50 or 60 and more that are registered, but uh, at any given day, you can have up to you know, six to eight boats around one single group of pilot whales. And the unfortunate thing is that pilot whales do live in, in a very core groups in this area, but at any given day, there can be six to eight groups around the area, the way that they work. Of every one boat sees another boat, and they all cluster around the same group and not, uh, not spend time out looking for new groups. And so this came about that the increase in the pressure on the animals was starting to be, there was worry about it, about whether it was going to uh, you know, affect their behavior, make them leave the area, and the, and the business would be lost, if only, if only for the commercial sense of it. A local environmental police force, known as the Calderon, enforces the whale-watching laws of the Canary Islands. The Spanish government, in response to this increase in whale-watching, began to regulate and control the number of operators taking tourists out to view the whales. This has resulted in less pressure on the whale pods surrounding the island, and their numbers appear to be increasing. Pilot whales have many unique characteristics that differentiate them from other species of whale. In some ways, they take group behavior and cooperation to very high levels. Pilot whales seem to live in the society that's based on families. Families are the most important part about pilot whales. When a calf is born, it's watched after very closely. There's some curiosity from other animals in the pod when a new calf appears in the group. And they, the calf is raised through a long period of maturation, you know, it takes I mean, females mature at about 12 or 13 years, and 
males are sort of sexually mature at 15 years old, but they don't actually become physically mature until around 20 years old. So the, the males have quite a longer adolescence, if you will. They fund milk in the stomachs of 15-year-old male pilot whales. So they're, it's not nutritional, but they're continuing to nurse. To me, it seems to be that it's so important to be a member of a group for the pilot whales that the mother makes sure that she's around to help take care of her, her sons and daughters before she dies. The way that they work together and the way that they have to live out in the open ocean, feeding on squid in deep water, usually far from shore, that it's, it's very important to be related to the animals that you're working with in terms of kind of the altruism that's required and that you're much more likely to work together as a unit with someone that you're, that you're related with in the general theory and animal behavior. So by the way, I seem to have taken it to an extreme can this observed behavior help us to solve the mystery of the cave? Could their need to band to even to the death explain how these whales died? This is an intriguing question, only a small fragment of the puzzle. To try to unravel more of the secrets held in the cave, we must return once again to the in the South Pacific. Here in the warm waters off of Fiji, pilot whale pods roam freely feeding on the abundant food. One of the Fijian islands, called Mataki, has been the home of the Douglas family for generations. Their explorations of the water surrounding the Fijian archipelago have led to many unique discoveries. Nigel and Carol Douglas were the first to discover the cave system and make the dangerous journey into the very heart of it. When we had the Matangi Princess One built a couple years back, we went out on an um, exploration trip looking for dive sites and the particular reef where the, where the whale cave is on, we we known from a long time back that it had a lot of deep vertical drop-offs on it. We were down at the side of the wall about 100 feet. We discovered that as we went down, it, the drop-off went further and further. There was myself and Carol and my dad and all. And after coming out of the cave from the first dive, it was, you know, it was all very exciting. It was, it was very dangerous, very exciting, a lot of adrenaline. The fact that the whales, the, the skulls were upside down, in fact, first preempted us to think that these were reptiles, probably amphibious land sea animals. And it's something special. And obviously, not being experienced and you know, finding many skulls around, the first thing you think of is a reptile. We didn't think to turn the whalebone skulls upside down and get a different perspective out of it. We didn't want to touch them. To reach the remote atoll where the cave lies, our film crew travels north on the Douglas's boat, the Matagi Island Princess. The exact location of the cave system is a well-guarded secret that the owners of Matagi Island have revealed only reluctantly to our crew. Outside, the weather takes a turn for the worse, making the difficult dive even more dangerous for the four divers, who will enter the cave system itself. Filmmakers John McKenney, Kevin Jurgensen, and still photographers Rod Farb and Walt Stearns will make the journey into the deep. Because this is such a difficult dive, we chose to use rebreathers, because with a rebreather, you have virtually unlimited uh, air supply. And since you have to begin the dive very, very deep and enter the cave and travel so far that by the time the dive is over and you swim back out of the cave, you've incurred a large decompression obligation and you're in the water for a long time. And really, the dive can only be done safely with a rebreather because it provides the time to do all the dive and all the decompression and have plenty of gas in case anything goes wrong during the dive. One requires a great deal of preparation, very skilled divers, and um, it's not one for the amateur diver to go and do himself. Jurgensen and Farb discuss the logistics of the upcoming dive with Wayne Herwill, the boat's dive master. What we've done is we've set a series of two lines for you guys. Um, the first line, which is a buoy line, is running down to approximately 60 feet. It will be easily identifiable for us up club side for the divers and for the boat to see it. The second line starts at about 70 to 80 feet and runs right down to 170 feet. Um, that will be weight, weighted down 
right to the center of the cave itself, the entrance or the mouth of the cave. What do we know about the cave layout itself? What we know about that is the cave lip starts at about 150, 155 feet, and it drops off into a narrower entrance as such. Once you get to that narrow entrance, it starts rising up to approximately 70 feet, and you have runoffs that run diagonally off the main chute itself. It does get very narrow as you get up to 70 feet. As Jurgensen and Farr prepare their rebreathers for the descent, McKenney briefs the support crew that will be present outside the cave. 170 feet is a whale cave, okay? Okay. Near the cave, we travel up here to this first set of bones. How long after the first unit is in do you want Eric and I to jump in? You come in eight minutes after we've hit the water. After we've made our jump, you guys hit the water. Travel down to about 160 to 170 feet. With all systems prepared, the divers begin to make final checks. With the dive plan firmly etched into their minds, the time has come to make the first dive. Each diver prepares himself for the task ahead. Dropping into the abyss, the comforting glow of sunlight begins to fade. The inky blackness surrounding the divers gives them the impression of a trip into the center of the earth. They enter as a group and begin their survey of the cave interior. The dive team comes upon the first skeleton so encrusted, it is almost indistinguishable from the rocks around it. For some unknown reason, its bones are spread out over a wide area of the cave entrance. Further up the cave lies the remains of another large skeleton. It too is encrusted with rock. Farb begins to document the location of the specimens. Jurgensen begins the lengthy process of measuring each bone and collecting samples. The first contact with the remains of these creatures brings a sense of awe to the divers. Stearns is now brought in to begin photographing the upper reaches of the cave. His first target is the second skeleton, nicknamed Big Bird, by the crew. This skeleton is in much better shape than the one at the entrance, though some of its bones, too, are fused to the rock. Jurgensen shares his thoughts. Silt was a major concern of all of us. You had to constantly be on guard not to stir up the silt from the bottom, which was everywhere. Anytime you moved, it seemed like a cloud of debris would begin to rise and block your vision completely. On one early dive, I got completely silted out and had to turn off my light and literally feel my way out in the dark. It wasn't very pleasant. To get accurate measurements of each skeleton, you had to carefully position yourself next to them without knocking up a bunch of silt. We needed accurate measurements of the skeletons so that we could determine uh, the, the size of the whales when they were alive. Into the dark abyss of the cavern, the divers ascend vertically into the very reef itself. 
Pekeni and Stearns head up through the twisting, turning labyrinth to reach the uppermost chamber. Every corner of the cave is riddled with holes and false turns. It is easy to become disoriented within the cave, and total concentration is required. This, then, is the most dangerous part of the dive. Once the divers have entered, they must press themselves between the immovable rocks. Were an emergency to happen now, such as a failure of their dive equipment, there would be no escape. Entering the last tunnel is an exercise in agility. A human can barely fit through the cracks in the rock. But beyond this restriction lies the last of the grave sites. These two small skeletons lie side by side, their terror and pain now just a distant memory, echoing off these walls of stone. It is as though you can still hear their furtive cries as they struggle in the darkness. The team is sobered with the thoughts of how these creatures met their cruel fate. But Kenny shares his feelings. I felt good about being in the cave. It was a place that seemed to warrant respect. It was like being in an old burial ground or a mausoleum, one of those places that you walk very quietly. The cave was a humbling experience for me. And one of the thoughts that ran through my mind was how these whales, who are so much more adept in the water than we humans are, seem to get so lost. Here I was with my breathing apparatus and my battery-powered lights, devices that were, at the time, seemed to be very artificial. Yet I knew if those devices failed me, there was no way I could get out of that cave in an emergency. Sorting through the tangle of bones, it is nearly impossible to determine which of these belongs to what skeleton. The size and condition of the bone provides further proof that these were immature animals. Measurements of the skulls must be done while in the chamber, for only one diver can fit into it at a time. While I was filming, I had to keep my mind focused in order to be productive, as our time in there was so limited. I couldn't get sidetracked by the sheer fascination of just being there. The dive nearly over, McKinney films Jurgensen taking another sample from the cave. The team must now make their way back out of the twisting maze of tunnels. Exiting the cave brings the welcome glow of blue and the promise of air and sunlight above. But it will be hours before the divers can make an exit to the safety of the boat. For every 15 minutes spent at the depth of the cave, one hour of decompression is required. To leave too soon invites an attack of what divers call the bends, or decompression sickness. The divers must now endure hours of decompression before they can leave the water. They will undergo this process day after day as each part of the cave is carefully mapped and additional samples are collected. Every time I left the cave, it was with um, mixed feelings. I knew I had to go because the decompression time we had to do was already pretty long. 
To stay longer meant doubling the time before getting back on the boat. But part of me wanted to stay, you know, to explore more and, and try and figure out exactly what happened to these animals. I found myself carrying the bone samples with me really carefully. Decompression after a dive is usually pretty boring, but this one was different. I had time to reflect on what I saw. And even though all of us were together on the decompression line, I think each of us was lost in his own thoughts about where he had just been. The, the whale cave dive for me was, um, was exciting, um, primarily because it was challenging. It wasn't an easy dive. It was deep. It was, uh, tight, tight, close quarters to move around in with a big, huge movie camera as well as lights. Um, lighting it and, and getting through these small crevices was difficult. At one point in time, I couldn't even wear my rebreather because it was too big. I had to actually wear just a single scuba tank and uh, take that off um, and squeeze up into the uppermost chamber in order to get a different angle uh, on these whales. And um, it was challenging. It was exciting, though. It was um, as sad as it was being in there. At the same time, it was exciting, and uh, I really enjoyed it. When you enter the cave and you you see this labyrinth of tunnels twisting and turning, and you immediately encounter the, the first two skeletons, the very large skeletons, um, it's kind of eerie. It's sort of, it looks like, a, like a, a chamber. As you go further and further up into the cave and you eventually encounter the two baby skeletons, um, you really get an impression of how terrorized these small animals must have been trying to get out and the only way they could think of to get out is the same as us is up and there is no way to get out of the cave going up and then you realize that the two larger skeletons down below were facing a sure exit they had a way out of this cave and uh, it's it's really very sad it's a very sad sight the exploration completed and both documented it is now time to try and unravel the mystery of the whale cave. The appearance of the bones, their placement and location within the cave, could suggest that this is merely a place where pilot whales go to die. Or is this just what it appears to be? The babies, stuck deep inside the cave, unable to get out, and their parents refusing to leave them, preferring to die with their children rather than abandon them. The best way to solve this part of the puzzle is through the use of modern technology, specifically the process known as radiocarbon dating. Samples collected during the dive will now be taken to the University of California, Riverside, where Dr. Irvin Taylor is chairman of the anthropology department. While we're alive, this isotope of carbon called radiocarbon, or carbon-14, maintains a constant amount in our living in living organisms and that's because it decays but it's replaced because we're alive we eat we respire we metabolize however when something dies the production stops because the organism no longer is metabolizing and the radiocarbon clock begins you measure the amount of radiocarbon is in something and compare it to what it's it is in living material Okay. you can tell how long it has been since that organism died. So a radiocarbon date gives you the time since the death of an organism. The lab first catalogs the bones brought in by the dive team and begins the preparation for carbon dating. Radiocarbon dating measures the amount of a particular isotope called carbon-14 that is found in all matter that came from a living organism. The amount of carbon-14 found in dead tissue decreases over time. Since the decrease in carbon-14 levels happens at a steady rate over centuries, measuring the amount of C14 in a sample tells scientists how long ago the organism died. The sample must first be processed in a procedure that will reduce the bone sample to pure carbon essentially burning away all traces of other organic compounds. As it turns out, whalebone usually yields excellent samples for radiocarbon dating. Many labs, in fact, use whalebone as a standard against which all other samples are measured. Hopefully, this will work to the scientists' advantage as they process and analyze the bones from the cave.
This reduction takes several days to accomplish and involves numerous steps to ensure that the samples are not contaminated. Dr. Donna Kerner has pioneered some of the techniques used by radiocarbon dating labs worldwide. In dating these bones, we will have to take into consideration the fact that they were found underwater, they are marine bones, and we will have to look at the diet of the pilot whales in order to see what kind of an effect that's going to have on the C14 content of the bone and then in turn how that will affect the date. Radiocarbon dating should tell us exactly how long ago the animals found in the cave system died. In turn, this will reveal whether or not they're linked as a family or simply a collection of animals who somehow found their way into the cave to die. Another clue which may help us in our quest for answers to the mystery of the cave is the strange behavior that pilot whales exhibit of stranding themselves on beaches and in shallow water. Dr. Baran has studied this phenomenon which occurs throughout the world. I mean, probably what's known most about pilot whales and other cetaceans as well, but pilot whales are one of the most common ones to strand, you know, to come up on the beach. Uh, pilot whales are one of the most common ones to show up as a group and often alive, there might be a few animals alive. In a few cases, there's been a scenario where one animal has come onto the beach and it's been sick, perhaps parasites in the ear. For some reason, it's, it, it can't swim anymore. And there seems to be some instinct, perhaps, that you know, I better get on land, I can't support my weight anymore, I'm gonna sink to the bottom and I wanna keep breathing. So they go out and, and seek land. And, uh, but it's almost as if the other animals come along because being a member of a group is so important and, and almost come onto the beach because they can't, you know, they don't want to abandon the animal that's sick and they also just, they don't want to be separated from a member of their group and, and, and that membership is so important. These tragic occurrences continue to baffle scientists. In some cases, it has been found that one or two of the beached whales has been ill. The others seem to have joined the sick ones rather than abandoned them. In one particular incident of beaching, the sick animal was joined by a pod of approximately 20 other whales, all beached themselves and were at risk of dying. However, once the sick whale had died, the others, almost as if they sensed the final inevitable loss of their companion, turned their bodies back out to the surf and swam off to sea. Around the world, these strandings gain a lot of attention from the nearby population, with many groups organizing to try to save the distressed animals. Students, housewives, scientists, even commercial fishermen, who often compete with the whales for fish stocks, come out in force to rescue them. Some are eventually directed out to sea. Some of the younger whales may even be transported to aquariums for recovery. But for all the human effort, most of the stranded whales will still die. Could this provide a possible explanation to what happened in the cave system? Could the four skeletons in the cave have simply stranded themselves, but this time underwater? The closer we get to possible answers, the deeper the mystery seems to be. One place where there is no mystery surrounding the death of pilot whales is the Faroe Islands off of Denmark. Like any whale strandings, the presence of these animals draws a lot of attention from the local population. Boats immediately head out to the bay and surround the whales. People come from miles around as if to greet them.
They even bring their children along to watch. But these humans are not interested in merely watching the whale. They are out for blood. Taking advantage of the natural instinct of pilot whales to stick together, the fishermen drive the animals ashore into shallow water. Once the whales have been forcefully beached, the slaughter begins in earnest. The hapless whales are hacked to death using any possible instrument, including knives, machetes, even hacksaws are put to gruesome labor. The killing goes on for hours. In the end, over 1,500 of these creatures, great and small, mothers and babies, are killed each year in the pharaohs. The Faroese claim that the hunt is necessary to provide them with fresh meat for the long winter. International outrage has failed to stop this massacre which makes the sea run red with blood. Families ripped apart, calves killed alongside their mothers. Even the tears of Neptune cannot save these noble beasts. After two weeks of processing at UC Riverside, the bone samples from the whale cave are then sent to the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory where they will be analyzed and the exact age of each determined. The mass spectrometer here at Livermore was originally designed for use by the military for nuclear bomb development. It has since been turned over to the university for civilian scientific research. It is one of the most precise instruments of its kind on Earth. Dr. John Southern heads the laboratory and will be conducting the test on the whalebone samples. Each sample is carefully loaded onto a wheel that will fire energized particles through the accelerator at incredible velocities. This then allows the scientists to separate and measure each radioactive isotope present in the sample, including the exact number of C14 molecules present. Testing and analysis of the samples is a process which can take hours to accomplish. After the testing is complete, the scientists gather with Jurgensen to view the results as they come in. What the tests reveal are clearly a surprise to all. So what we have here is we've got two animals that died together and two that died a thousand years apart. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Okay, so the bottom line is they're not all the same age and the whale near the entrance has a radiocarbon age of about 2,700 years. Your big bird whale is about 3,700, and the two little guys up at the end of the cave are very recent. They've got bomb carbon in from the hydrogen bomb testing, so they, they come from the mid-70s. Several whales at different times, for whatever reason, came along and died in that same cave which is really interesting to think about why did they do that. As in all mysteries, investigation leads to clues, clues to conjecture, and facts lead us to answers. With refined calculations, we know this to be true. Sometime around 1803 B.C., 3,800 years ago, a lone pilot whale swam into this cave, wedged itself into a cavern in the side of the rock, and died. This was about the same time that Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt. There it lay for a thousand years, until the year 803 BC, 
some 2,700 years ago when a second whale, the one located at the entrance, swam into the cave, lay down and died. Jesus of Nazareth was still almost 800 years away from being born. Together, these two creatures occupied the cave all alone for another 2,700 years until the year 1975 when two small pilot whales, a juvenile and a baby, swam into the cave, became lost and perished together. As is often the case in human exploration of the ocean depths, our original belief that this was a family of whales that all died together has been proven wrong. But the answer to how old these skeletons are has raised even more questions. Have we stumbled upon a burial ground where pilot whales go to die? Or is this simply a maze which traps careless animals? Do the songs of the whale tell the story of this cave to the young? Do they ever visit this graveyard of their elders, much like we do? And what lessons could this possibly have for humankind? Perhaps the discovery of this underwater grave is a reminder to us that not all of the sorrows and tragedies on this planet involve human beings. And what of the two small skeletons that died only a few years ago? It is still not hard to imagine how they may have met their cruel fate, for in the darkness of the cave, they could not see their way out. Even their sonar may have failed them. Unfortunately, we have no answers for these questions and are left to speculate as to how these young whales died. If the young animal, if the smallest skeleton is the farthest back in the cave, you know, it could be that this young animal was off exploring, you know, trying to find new areas, maybe chasing a fish or something and kind of lost track of where it was and, and actually got stuck in the cave. The other animals would always be aware of, of where it was and you know where it was last seen and all that. And of course they would follow it in there. I mean a calf is, is the is the production of the pod, you know, and, and they're very they attract a lot of attention in the pod. If they couldn't get that calf out, as as I was saying about the strandings, you know, that being a member of a group is so important that they would they would stay and they wouldn't abandon that calf and they it could come to the case where they finally suffocated, you know, where they they couldn't couldn't get to the surface to take a breath and, and and that could be how they would die. For us, we are left with part of a mystery resolved, yet the story is incomplete. The death of these whales will forever lie as one of many enigmas we encounter in the ocean realm. The sea is where we and all other life came from. It is the place which harbors the vitality of the earth. But in this realm, the blue ocean water masks the dramas played out below from our landlocked eyes. But what tales are told here? What fables and legends rise and fall, only to be carried off in the drifting sea as across time itself? It's actually, it's almost like entering a, entering a tomb of some kind that's been forgotten of in time. I guess I can to stumbling across the Egyptian mummies. I don't believe that anyone will ever have any answers as to how it happened, why it happened, but the fact is that it did happen. And the only ones that do know are obviously the whales that have taken the secret with them. If we know how these creatures got into these small places, how they position themselves facing out. And how does a whale, a pilot whale, which is a big animal, manage to fit into the space that you could barely fit into? And just the whole size, the whole pain, the anguish. Um, and whichever way you look at it, death, 
in a situation like this is very, very sad. And that's what I'm left with, sadness. It is true that the sea runs cold, but it contains the hottest blood and memories that last for all eternity.